Please stand with me and turn to hymn 125, Joy to the World. Sing 
I think uh, for Christmas devotion, you should study the hymns of the church. Wow. What did they know? What were they hearing preached? Ask yourself that question. And they're not infallible like the Bible, but wow, they knew a lot of good stuff, didn't they, that came from the Bible and from the teaching of God's Word. So we're thankful. If you believe the words of God and you believe the things recorded in the Apostles' Creed, we invite you to say them with us. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, His only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day He rose from the dead. He ascended into heaven, and is sitting on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there he shall come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the one universal church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Amen. Let's pray. Father, thank you for this blessed time to come into your house. Throughout Scripture, it talks about the congregation or the assembly. In, in the New Testament, it says, don't forsake the assembling of yourselves together. And so much the more as you see the day approaching, that tells us that we will be able, through what you've told us in Holy Scripture and through the prophecies, the truth that you've given us, we'll be able to know that that time is getting closer and closer. We don't know the day or the hour, but we can certainly know the season. And so you've told us when we do see those things coming to pass, it's going to be even more important that we do this. And we see the wisdom of that. We embrace it. We acknowledge it. We see the wonder of it. Thank you for what you do when we gather as your people. And Father, we know that the truth preached is the central part of all that's to be done here. And then we sing about it because we know you. We praise you because we know you. We honor you. And we know it's all because of Christ. And the great celebration that's going on right now is a celebration we have in our hearts every day, but it's wonderful that we have a time where the whole world pauses and says, let's celebrate the birth of Jesus together as a world, as a nation. Thank you, Father, for the opportunity to do that. We know the enemy would like to change the meaning of Christmas, would like to remove the name Christ in all that we celebrate, but we will not have it, uh, for we will say Merry Christmas. Uh, we will say God bless you. Help us, Lord, to be what we need to be, not arrogant, but humble, and a humble servant and tool in your hands. We ask that you'd bless and use us today and then use us out there. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you. you may be seated. I uh, saw I'm messing around with the camera and all that. I'm hoping technology's working because I know there's a couple uh, in Utah that probably would have enjoyed uh, seeing or hearing that. Uh, Andrew and Valerie are skiing in Utah, and so they hopefully were able to hear their daughters sing so beautifully for the Lord today. Uh, we have a grandson on a mountain in Colorado. We have a daughter and son-in-law on a mountain in Utah. So pray for all of those who are scattered throughout and will be traveling during this busy season. I know that applies to a lot of you. We're praying for you. But we're thankful that you're here. 
<laughs> We're glad to have you. Are there any special announcements that anybody has? Pam, you always have good news for us. Yeah, that's <laughs> great news. So we'd like to invite everybody on uh, January 2nd, which is two weeks from today, Sunday morning. Instead of having Sunday school, we thought maybe we'd have a quick fellowship. Coffee, cinnamon rolls, who knows what else might pop up and be there to eat. So uh, from 9.30 to 10.30, uh, two weeks from today, let's bringing yeah. the New Year together. All right. And then uh, February 12th, we'd like to do our first game night. We want to try something new this year in fellowship, along with movie night <laughs> this coming year, but game night on February 12th from 4 to 8. Of course, there'll be food to go with the game, but we'd like to invite everybody to that as well. Okay, February the 12th, game night or afternoon, at what time? 4 to 8. 4 to 8. So... I'm saying that for those that can't hear what's being said in the congregation. And then uh, the Sunday right after New Year's, so that would be my mother's birthday, January the 2nd, right? We're going to have a fellowship. We'll tell mom it's in her honor that we're having a fellowship. And that's in place of Sunday school. One of the good things that does is if you're a Sunday school teacher during all the festivities of the couple of weeks before that, then you won't have to think about having a lesson that, that Sunday. So we're just going to enjoy fellowship together. Thank you for that. Anyone else? Yes, Vicki. Thanks to Dennis and Rebecca, I have the, the directory updated to the best of my knowledge. Good. Some people have said they want to have a hard copy. They're not good on the computer. So I've got a pad of paper back there and a pen. Please put your name on there if you want a hard copy. I'll leave it there because obviously the people all right, thank you for doing that. Uh, Vicki Parker's updated our directory. There'll be a uh, hard copy available if you want to sign up on the, on the kitchen bar back there. It'll be there for a couple of weeks. But she's gotten it updated. If, if something's not right in it, be sure and let us know because it'll be an ongoing process of keeping that updated, hopefully. Lorna? Or the horizontal file that's in the storeroom. Right. Because we use those drawers all the time. It's for Sunday school supplies and lessons, and we, pull, we might use it every week. But every time we turn around, there's something in front of it. Right. Somewhere else in that room, yes, but not in front of the broadcast. Yes. I know after, after programs and things like that, everybody's tired and they tend to just throw stuff in there, and we need to be better, especially in front of that file cabinet. Thank you, Lorna, for reminding us of that. Anybody else? I've got a couple of cards I'm going to read. This one says, Hark the herald angels sing, glory to the newborn king. May, may the goodness of the Lord delight you, the glory of the Lord shine upon you, and the gift of his love surround you. Merry Christmas. That's what the uh, card writers wrote and was selected for you. And then these handwritten words from uh, Kenny, Jackie, and Faye Johns. Simple words cannot express the love we have for you, our precious church family. Thank you so much for your prayers, texts, cards, and the generous gift card and beautiful plant. We felt your prayers and the love and concern you showed to us and our family during our recent loss. We are truly blessed. We know that several of you also lost loved ones this year and our hearts and prayers go out to you. This Christmas, even though we are sad, we are also joyful and thankful for God's most precious gift of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, and also for the time we had with our precious loved ones who have gone to be with him and for the wonderful memories we will always have. Merry Christmas and love to you all. Kenny, Jackie, and Faye. Johns. And that's Kenny's mom, if y'all don't know Faye that well. Pray for her especially. We love the Johns family. And then uh, Peace on Earth, the card says, and it says, I thank God every night for my church. The card itself says, star of wonder, star of light, star with royal beauty bright, westward leading, still proceeding, guide us to thy perfect light. Terry Franklin prays for her church every night. And we really appreciate that, Terry, that you do that. 
If you, yes, Amy. I know, you're just saying so much, but. That's fine. feels like she doesn't do as good a job as Andrew, but I would have to, I would have to argue with that. It is, it is indeed a godly burden, that's a good thing, to serve as pastor of this church, and I, I go into that with fear and trembling, and I have a, such a wonderful help meet. Not only is my support, but she loves this church and gives herself for it. And that's, a, that's above and beyond. And so to have the privilege of being set free by a congregation to study the Word of God is a privilege that I don't take lightly. And I appreciate all of you for it. And then what we want is those who love it, who love the truth. And this congregation, you love God, you love His truth, and you love each other. And we're so thankful for you. And we can't say enough. I need Andrew up here, too, to <laughs> express my appreciation. We know Andrew does such a good job. Hopefully he's listening. If you have a prayer need, we're going to ask that you stand, and we're going to pray for you. We're going to take down your name so we can continue to pray for you. I, I hope Joy and Larry are standing. They are, because Joy's having surgery tomorrow for her knee. Uh, others have needs that maybe we're not aware of. I know little Alex and Micah are kind of sick right now, so we're praying for them. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for these who are standing. We pray that you would bless and meet the needs that we do know about, but also those that are just on the hearts of your people that they don't need to share details, but they want all of us to be praying for them. We ask that your will be done in their lives. Thank you again for the faith that they demonstrate by standing to their feet. Because they're saying, I believe in the power of God through prayer in the name of Jesus Christ. And we ask that you would meet them in a very special way. Meet them in the midst of their tribulation and trials. Meet their needs that they have. And we trust you for the wisdom of how to do that. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Everybody else, let's stand. We're going to sing 152.
ushers come, that's another one of my favorite Christmas hymns because it's so real. It faces reality. It says, sometimes I'm singing peace on earth and I feel like just the opposite here on earth. But you know, God has provided in his son, Jesus Christ. You can have peace in your heart even when the world has gone mad. And then there's coming the day that the hymn says that there will be peace on earth when he comes to rule and reign the whole earth. And so we can have peace now and we look forward to that peace then, don't we? Amen. Amen. Cindy, would you lead us in our offertory prayer? Thank you. Dear Heavenly Father, I'm just so grateful to be here in your house. And I'm so grateful to be in a place where I know that the people here are, are seeking you, and seeking your truth and loving you, and that we have pastors here that preach your truth no matter what. For, Father, it is your truth that sets us free. It sets us free from our sins, yes. But it sets us free from sinning. That we have the power of your Holy Spirit and your truth indwelled in us that we might be your son. Serving you and living for you and trusting you. May everyone here understand what it means. That true meaning of Christmas. That you came down as a real man through your son, Jesus. And you suffered on that cross. Not just for me, but for all of us in this room and all over the world. And for those to be born ahead too. And we look back and we say, thank you, Jesus. Thank you that you came as that real baby. And you grew and you chose as a human to live perfect. Mm -hmm. And the only way we can be perfect is if we accept your son, Jesus. Mm -hmm. And through your son, Jesus, we can be complete. And I thank you for that. And I pray, Father, that you will use the offerings that are here today for your glory. And I thank you so much, Father, for all of these people all the time, not just in their monies, but their life and their service. Mm -hmm. That speaks such volumes for you, Father. And I thank you for them. I love them. And I thank you for being with the children and how you helped us last Sunday night to present the program for you. Because we do this all for your glory. We sing praises to you. We lift our voices high and we are giving you all the glory. And we love you. Just as the angel shouted out, glory to God in the highest. We say that too, Father. And thank you. We love you. And we praise this in your son, Jesus. Amen. 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 Thank you. May be seated. <laughs>
Praise the Lord. Through the doxology. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, all creatures there below. Praise Him above ye heavenly host. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Amen. Choir's coming. You may be seated. Many details of that first Christmas night remain a mystery, but one thing is certain, love changed it. Bethlehem would always be remembered, the word manger would take on a new meaning. Anyone speaking of shepherds on a hillside, angel songs, or wise men from the east would spark countless imaginings of what it was like. It was all because God's love took an ordinary night and consecrated it forever.
prayer today, Lord, come into the ordinary. Ordinary. It's important that you know that God's human instruments are ordinary, isn't it? It's supposed to be, I know Pastor Jerry, he's just a normal old guy, right? Amen. But we're praying that God's truth would come through this ordinary, that God's light, God's Holy Spirit would come and bring something of Him. Amen. Hebrews chapter 10, beginning with verse 1. Hebrews 10, 1, For the law having a shadow of good things to come and not the very image of the things, can never, with those sacrifices which they offered year by year continually, make the comers thereunto perfect or complete. For then would they have not, then they, let me start over. For then would they not have ceased to be offered. Because that the worshipers once purged should have had no more conscience of sin. But in those sacrifices, there is a remembrance again made of sins every year. Talking about in the Old Testament, constant sacrificing over and over again. For it is not possible that the blood of bulls and of goats should take away sins. Wherefore, when he cometh into the world, he saith, say Sacrifice and offering thou wouldest not, but a body hast thou prepared me. In burnt offerings and sacrifices for sin, you had no pleasure. Then said I, lo, I come. In the volume of the book, it is written of me to do thy will, O God. Above when he said, sacrifice and offering and burnt offerings and offering for sin, thou wouldest not, neither hadst pleasure therein, which are offered by the law. Then said he, lo, I come to do thy will, O God. He taketh away the first that he may establish the second. The old covenant was taken away and the new one established. By the which will we are sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. Once for everybody, once and for all, and once for all people. It was provided. When it comes to the eternal all-powerful authority of all created, all that is created, all creation, that word impossible should always arrest our attention. Should get our attention. First of all, in verse 1, it says, can never, for the law having a shadow of good things to come and not the very image of the things, can never, never make the comers perfect. Never. Cannot. And then in verse 4, for it is not possible. It is not possible. When it comes to God, we need to listen when it says it's not possible. Verse 5, by Jesus coming into the world, he said it, didn't he? Wherefore, when he came into the world, that's what we celebrate today. Uh, he, he started, he came, and then he said some stuff once he got here. He said, sacrifice and offering you would not, but you prepared me a body. He didn't just say it when he was here, but he said it by coming. He said it by coming. Sacrifice and offering you would not. It didn't satisfy you, it didn't please you, it didn't provide what you require, what you have to have. What did Jesus say by coming into the world? I'm the only way. I'm the one and only. Nothing else works. By coming into the world, he said that. Before he came into the world, he said it. In fact, God penned through the Apostle Paul in Galatians 2.21, If righteousness come by the law, then Christ is dead in vain. If it would have worked that way, if it could have been accomplished that way. And I want you to know, almost every false religion out there is a works 
salvation, religion. He says, if that would have worked, I would have done it that way. But it did not work. If there had been any other way, that way would have been taken. And Jesus coming says, says it. God the Father stand in the garden of Gethsemane, says it. When Jesus pleaded for his life, pleaded to be spared of all the agony he was going to go through, the Father's answer says it. Jesus begged, if there be any other way, let this cup pass from me. If it be possible, let this cup pass from me. If you can secure mankind any other way than through the death and the resurrection of Jesus Christ, do it. He had a vested interest. If there was some other way, impossible. Impossible. His coming into the world and his going to the cross says no other way. No other way. The entire Bible tells me so. See what Hebrews 10, 7 said. Then said I, lo, I come in the volume of the book. It is written of me to do my Father's will. In the whole book it says it. Not just Matthew. Not just Luke. That's where we get most of our Christmas scriptures from. Not just in Luke. And I could go on to the end of Revelation. Not just in the New Testament. But all the way back to Genesis. He said in the entire volume of God's revelation, it says this. It says it, and His coming says it. The Father's refusal of His Son in the Garden of Gethsemane says it. God needed Jesus. And I want you to hear that. God needed something. And that's, that's a big thing to understand. And you've got to understand it. He needed it. And all that Old Testament stuff wasn't God trying something. It wasn't Him trying something. It was Him telling everyone there's only one way. And it's coming. Jesus was coming for them. And their forgiveness was based on a future event, a future provision. They knew it was coming. The ceremonial Old Testament law contained object lessons used by the Holy Spirit to teach of a loan required sacrifice. Thousands upon thousands of physical symbolic sacrifices were made to speak of one. The satisfaction of the divine need. Not a need to be complete. That's what I need you to understand. Not for God to be who he is. He's complete and perfect and never needs anything for him to be God in his holy nature. But a divine need for that which allows action on the part of God that he desires. Yes, there are impossibilities with God. If you read your Bible, you know that's true. Not in relation to his power. He's all powerful and you know that. With God all things are possible. Matthew 19, 26 says. With God all things are possible. But in relation to maintaining his holy nature. Uh, you've heard it before from this pulpit. Hebrews 6, 18. It is impossible for God to lie. Amen. There's an impossibility with God. Right. And we need to understand it. Not lack of power. But he can't do it and still maintain his perfect holy nature. That's so important. Therefore, there's where the needs for God come from. His desires that must harmonize with his holy nature. Those who state that God doesn't need us are certainly right as far as the completeness of his nature or his power. But as far as having what he desires, he needed Jesus and he needs his children. To have what he desired. God desired to love and be loved. And that created a need. Out of a holy desire. Nothing lacking in God. But he had a desire. If he didn't have a desire. He never would have created in the first place. Because a desire to love and be loved. Caused him to take an action. To create something. To make something. God desired to be loved 
And in that desire, he created a need for himself. The top of that list that he needed was Jesus. To make an everlasting love relationship possible, he needed Jesus. And every Old Testament saint knew that Jesus was coming. And every Jewish mother hoped that she would bear the Messiah someday. She would be so blessed. Because they knew he was coming. Again, what did Job say? Most of you know it. I'm going to insert some parenthetical commentary along with it, if you'll allow me. Job said, I know that my Redeemer liveth. Because he's the eternal God. And that he shall stand on the latter day upon the earth. He would come in the flesh. My God would stand on the earth in the latter day. And though after my skin worms destroy my flesh. He said his body would come back. He would go back to the dust of the ground. Yet in my flesh I shall see God. In my flesh I shall see God. Even though worms destroy this body, in my flesh I shall see God. What a gospel presentation that was. Of I'm going to go to the dust of the ground. The worms are going to destroy my body. But I want you to know I'm going to see God someday in the future. Because my Redeemer lives. And He's going to stand on the earth in the latter day. I'm going to see Him one day. Simeon in the temple that day when baby Jesus was brought for his dedication. I didn't want to go into all the ritual and explanation, so we'll just call it his dedication. Luke 2.25, it says of Simeon, he was just and devout, waiting for the consolation of Israel. Waiting for that one that would bring this promised relief to Israel. It was revealed to him, to Simeon, that he wouldn't see death until he had seen the Lord's Messiah. God came to him in a dream and said, you're going to be so privileged. All have looked forward to this for generation after generation. They spoke of it and you've heard it preached and you've heard it taught. But you're going to see it before you die. Praise God. I wish an angel would come to me and say, you're going to see the rapture before you die. Wouldn't that be glorious? You're going to see it. You've heard about it for generation after generation. You've heard it preached. You've heard it taught. But it's going to happen while you're living. Wow. Could it happen while I'm alive? I believe it could. Just like them for thousands of years and thousands upon thousands of years looked for the coming of the Messiah, we're looking for him, aren't we? We're, it might happen in our generation. How stunned they were that it happened in their generation, his first coming. He stood waiting for the consolation. He stood waiting for the Lord's Messiah, the one to come to do not our will, but the Father's will. Not to satisfy my will, but to satisfy the Father's will. Not my need, but his. If we could only understand that. Satisfy a very real need of God in order to have what he desires for eternity. See, God's needs have to do with his desires. He desired a love relationship forever, which created a, a need. Do you all understand if you're going to have a creation that loves you, you, re, you create a holy need for a creation. Does that make sense to everybody? I hope it does. He had a need. Isaiah 53, 11, speaking prophetically of God the Father beholding His only begotten Son on the cross. He says this, He shall see the, the travail of His soul and He shall be satisfied. Satisfied. Need met. He shall be satisfied. He's not happy that He's suffering. He's not happy that people are spitting on Him and driving nails in His hand. Not happy about any of that stuff. But He's satisfied that the need has been met, that a life has been lived, and then that place for my sins and your sins to be judged as they deserve. Satisfaction of a very real need. The word satisfied is often is used often of the human need for food and having that need met with food. It's the same word here where it says he shall be satisfied. 
We have a hunger. We have a need. We have a desire. And he says, I'm satisfied with him, with Jesus. The desire to have an everlasting love relationship, impossible without sin being properly dealt with. And in provision, it's dealt with in Jesus. But now there's another impossible for God. Hebrews 11.6 says, Without faith, it's impossible for you to please Him. Impossible. Without faith. God has a need. It's you. And He says, Without faith, you can't meet that need. Why? Because faith cometh by hearing, hearing by the word of God, and faith is about God and who he is. We need to know him. He says, without you knowing me, I can't have what I desire for all of eternity. Y'all hear it? Without faith, it is impossible, impossible for God to be pleased. It's an impossibility with God. Without you believing, it's impossible for your sins to be removed, for your sins to be forgiven. And God needed Jesus, and now He needs you for the satisfaction of His desire. Not to complete His nature, but to satisfy His desire to love and be loved forever. A desire not just for anybody, but a desire for you. For you are included in the all of Hebrews 10.10, by the which will we are sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. God so loved the world. He needs you. He needs you. People object to that wording, but I want to put it in context. He doesn't need us to complete him. But he needs us because he has a desire. He needs us. And you're one of them. He says, I need you. I need you. For God so loved the world. And God is not willing that any should perish. You heard that in scripture? He's not willing that any should perish. But he wants all to come to repentance. Because without faith. And that's the first step of faith is repentance. Without faith you can't please him. You can't satisfy him. You can't be that satisfaction that he's longing for. God's desire has created a holy need, a need for Jesus, a need for you to receive Jesus. In Hebrews 10, we heard it in verse 1. The law was just a shadow of a reality, of the very real thing. And the shadow can never, with those sacrifices which were offered year by year, continually make the comers Complete. They can't do it. It's impossible. It's an impossible for God to save you that way. Verse 4, for it is not possible that the blood of bulls and goats should take away. Not possible. Well, you're God. You can do anything. No, he can only do that which is in harmony with his own holy nature. And any desire he has can only be fulfilled that way. There are a lot of people that are going to look forward to to the day of the Lord. And there's an Old Testament prophet says, Woe unto you who desire the day of the Lord, for it is darkness for you and not light. It is darkness for you and not light. You can fill in the blank. It is not possible for my works of the flesh to take away sin. It is not possible that Buddha, and we could fill in the blank with all the other Religious leaders and messiahs. It's not possible that Muhammad satisfy God for your sins. Take away sin. Only Jesus and only faith in Jesus. God found no satisfaction of his need in any other. I love the question God asked. Where Isaiah could, could hear in Isaiah 6, 8. Whom shall I send? And who will go for us? And that's another way of saying me, God the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Who will go for me? Then he said, here am I, Lord, send me. Who will be there for me? Who will satisfy my need for somebody to preach the gospel? 
Who will satisfy my need for somebody to accept the gospel? I love the words found in Matthew 21, 3, Mark 11, 3, Luke 19, 31, and 34. It just has to do with a donkey. But it says the Lord has need of him. The Lord has need. You just tell the owner of that donkey if he has a problem with you taking this donkey for Jesus to ride through the gates of Jerusalem and be acknowledged as the King of kings and Lord of lords. If you have a problem with that, just tell them if he has a problem with it, tell him the Lord needs it. The Lord needs it. Hallelujah. For God to say, I need you. I need you. Without faith, we can't be there for him. We can't please him. Then our faith, when we have it, becomes a satisfaction of a need. And since faith cometh by the word of God, publishing the word is a satisfaction of a real need. As Romans 10, 14 says, how shall they hear without a preacher? God needs preachers. And I'm not talking about pastors. He needs those too. He needs preachers of the word. He needs them. Teaching our children is a need that God has. Teach your children. God needed Jesus and now God needs you. And Jesus said in Matthew 8, 35, Whosoever shall lose his life for my sake shall gain it. You're going to lose it for him? I give it up for him, for his purpose, for his need, for his desire. Revelation 22, 17, the spirit and the bride say, come. And let him that hears say, come. That's talking to you if you've heard him. So those of you that are hurting, you join us in saying, come, come. And let him that is a thirst come. And whosoever will. Whosoever will, let him take of the water of life freely. God says, I need you to come, and I need you to come my way. I need you to come by your own free will because it satisfies a a desire of God. The Apostle Paul's words were recorded by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit in 1 Corinthians 15, 10. Yet not I, but the grace of God which was with me. That's amazing. The grace of God with me. Y'all hear that? Not just the grace of God. The grace of God with me. God created me with the power that I might choose. And you know that's the most wonderful power. That is the most satisfying love that God could ever have. That's his greatest desire. He needs you to believe. Grace with me. God says, I've got all the grace you need. All I need is you now. Do you all hear it? For the whole world, I've got all the grace they need. That's provision. That's power. I've got all you need. All I need is you. All I need is you. In order to produce the fruit, God's will, God's needs, God. Satisfaction. Jesus said, abide in me. Abide in me. And you'll produce the fruit the Father desires. If you'll abide in me. I kept saying I was going to read Ken Tyndall's poem. I'm running out of time, so I think I better do it now. Do y'all know Brother Ken Tyndall and our Robinson Church? Some of, some of you know him very well, personally, because you've been so involved in our denominational work. He wrote a poem while I was his pastor. I pat myself on the back because he wrote it while I was his pastor. I break my arm, pat myself on the back. "'Twas the eve before time began. "'Twas the eve before time began, and all through God's space everything was peaceful, for no sin had taken place. The angels were all snug in God's holy sight, and Lucifer was still an angel of light. When all of a sudden there rose such a clatter, God sprang into action. He foreknew this grave matter. Some angels had sinned and messed up their fate. Alas, for those, it was already too late. God started a plan that would bring sorrow, it's true. But when finished, eternity would be made safe for all, even you. He created a man and from him a wife. He put them in a garden and breathed into them life. 
He gave them a mind, a spirit, and a will that was free. They resembled the beast, but also angels, you see. Then came the fall with its pain, suffering, and sorrow, but there was always a hope for a brighter tomorrow. The angels were watching with fascinated interest in hopes that with the manifold wisdom of God, they'd be blessed. The law and the prophets were a burdensome affair. The need for a savior was clearly pointed to there. But how would he do it and keep himself pure? The angels thought mankind was a lost cause, I'm sure. Those little old priests were so lively and quick, but the rituals and sacrifices just didn't do the trick. Then in a moment the plan was revealed, by one man's sin came, by one it's repealed. The angels were frenzied, there was glory on high. They got so excited they appeared in the sky. His mission was essential, but his life would be short. He would suffer an awful death to enter my heart. Now Adam and Noah and Moses and Abe could all go to heaven just because of that babe. The rest of mankind have the hope of heaven now too. If our acceptance is real and our faith remains true. Scarcely did God open this one narrow way and still keep his perfect nature in sway. Hey, God is no Santa. He didn't use an elf. He became a real man. He humbled himself. The story's not over, but the end is so near. So Merry Christmas to you. And be of good cheer. Love you all. Now you know why I'm breaking my arm, patting myself on the back. <laughs> my great, great friend, Ken Tindall, we thank him for that. I want us to sing, at least for a little while, Paul and Jean, if you'd come. Number 327, Jesus is calling, 327. Let's stand.
you to answer. He needs you to answer. Let's pray. Father, thank you that we can say, Lord, what do you need from me? What do you need in my life? Help us to ask that question. We know that we couldn't even ask the question except that you needed Jesus to come. Thank you for Jesus. Thank you that as a Christian, I had the testimony that every Christmas becomes more meaningful, not less meaningful, not tired of hearing the old songs, not tired of hearing all the expressions, because with your truth and your Holy Spirit, each day becomes sweeter and each Christmas becomes more meaningful. And yeah, we've had hard times and we've had good times through Christmases, but you've always been good. And we just praise you and thank you. And pray that would always be true for all of us, that we would listen to you. We'd desire to know more. And then, Father, we would say with the prophet, here am I, Lord, send me. Help us, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Amen.